All right, good afternoon. We are live recording. We finished, uh, I finished, I keep saying we. Um, there's no one else here with me. I'm the one who's reading this. I finished chapter 13 in the book of Luke last night. So I will start chapter 14, reading out the NIV translation. And oh, I wanted to show you too before I start the progress of reading the word. So this is I have this week. So I have including this one, so two, four, six, eight more hours of reading. And then next week ten more hours. So I think I think I'll be done sometime. Maybe at the beginning of next week. I don't know. What do you think? It's going to be close. But I think I'll get it done. I'm going to get it done regardless, actually. I'm, yeah. It's going to be done. <laughs> I'm going to read the Bible in less than a year. That's what I didn't even think that was possible. All right. Chapter 14. Jesus at a Pharisee's house. Verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Verse 5, Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, Will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important seat. Verse 10, but when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might they may invite you back and so you will be repaid but when you give a banquet invite the poor the crippled the lame the blind and you will be blessed although they cannot repay you you will be repaid to the resurrection of the righteous wow it's already hitting me it's already hitting me <laughs> it's already i feel it i feel it got goosebumps man just man there's so much to this like I'm just thinking like what kind of luncheon would it be like would it be for your job would it be for an award ceremony I'm, I'm not too sure you know Very interesting. Okay. The parable of the great banquet, verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it please excuse me another said I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out please excuse me verse 20 still another said I just got married so I can't come the servant came back and reported this to his master then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly into the streets and, and alleys of the town and bring in the poor the crippled the blind and the lame Sir, the servant said, 
What you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Oh, that was, that was the parable. Go out, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Okay, so I look in the beginning, it says, verse 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all like began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I just must go and see. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen. And I'm on my way to try that. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. And the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled and blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes to compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. So I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The cost of being a disciple. Verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to, turning to them. He said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Excuse me. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it for if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it everyone who sees it will ridicule you verse 30 saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish or suppose a king is able to go to war against another king won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one command against him with 20,000 holy spirit i gotta pray you are more than welcome in this atmosphere you are more than welcome in this place. You are more than welcome in my mind. Amen. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Verse 35, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. That completes chapter 14. So when I, I read that right, I'm like, man, I wonder if there's a purification process that we have with technology that can make salt salty again. You know, um, which he's ex I, I believe Jesus is talking about believers because we are the salt of the world. Um, so like, I'm not too sure what that looks like, um, in a believer that's lost its salt. Um, maybe I do, but I know that God is full of mercy, full of compassion. So, um, we are not like literal salt. We're more than just literal salt. So, I don't, it's not, and nothing's impossible with God. So he can bring that person back. To have some flavor in my opinion but he does have a great question salt is good but if it loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again 
All right, that completes chapter 14. Chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep. All right, so we're getting into these parables, right? So I got to put my thinking cap on. All right. The parable of the lost sheep. Verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told him this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Verse 5. And when, he and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Oh, oh my goodness. Hallelujah. I have found my lost sheep. See? This, is, this gives us insight, again, into the spiritual realm, into heaven. Because what does Jesus say? I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing. Where? In heaven. In heaven. Heaven. Mm, heaven. Over one sinner who repents. Over one sinner who repents. You know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to go out when I go to the gym go play basketball it just makes me want to go talk to someone pray with them and, and, and just help them to repent because I want I want I want there to be rejoicing in heaven and plus I can speak when I evangelize that's the one of the best communications anywhere you go Everywhere, every day, because church is not a Sunday day, Sunday, check in a box, one hour, come and go. No, it's every day. Mm, let's go. Hallelujah. Who repents, one sinner who repents, then over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Ooh, I like this parable, the parable of the lost sheep, man. I'm going to put a star next to it. Ooh. All right. The parable of the lost coin. Verse, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay. Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. So now we get, we get more uh, spiritual insight into heaven. Because what does it say? Verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know what? I'm gonna message my um, I'm gonna message someone that I met at LA Fitness who I invited to church and I'm going to I'm gonna message him and see if I can we can meet up at LA Fitness later today. His name is Joshua. We met in the sauna.
just text him. Alright. Mmm! It's amazing. This is a good question. Do you want angels of God to rejoice in heaven? Alright. The parable of the lost son. Verse 11. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered, there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Verse 15, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. But while he was was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and you never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Verse 30, But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fan calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's the parable, man. That's, woo, that completes chapter chapter 15. And, uh, wow. I see, I see love in there. I see forgiveness. I see mercy. I see restoration. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, look at that. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Wow. Sometimes, you know, I, I feel like th that son who comes back, you know. There's something I noticed here. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fan calf for him. All right. Chapter 16, the parable of the shrewd manager. Verse 1. All right. 
parable, another parable of the shrewd manager. Verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accursed of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know that I'll be, I'll do so that. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Verse 5. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it four hundred and fifty. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. Man, Bank of America, stop calling me. My goodness. So, that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be honest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I'm going to read that again, verse 13. No one, no one, nobody, no one, not me, can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Yeah, that's so like interesting. That's like The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. My goodness. Additional teachings. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Alright, now we have the rich man and Lazarus. I put a little slash, I put hell. Because um, we're gonna it's gonna talk about hell right here, alright? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury 
every day. Verse 20. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. There's something there, but I, I don't understand. But there's something there to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. So hell. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. We'll read that again. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water. Dip just the tip. So like a small portion, right? And cool my tongue. Because I am in agony in this fire. Verse 25, but Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus, Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place. Notice how he uses the word chasm, you know. From, from the spiritual world, hell and heaven, to this world, the physical of this earth. This is real. This is 100% real. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us not anyone he answered then I beg you father send Lazarus to my family for I have five brothers let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment Abraham replied they have Moses and the prophets let them listen to them Verse 30, No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Wait, it says Abraham replied. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Verse 30, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That completes chapter 16. My goodness gracious. So I was speaking about my, um, a man named Joshua, right, just a little bit ago. Who I met in the sauna at LA Fitness, right? And and times when I'm in there, I, I think about hell. You know, not that I'm you know crazy or anything, but it talks about what did um, the rich man say? I think he just said he was in torment. 
Oh no, yeah, he was in agony in this fire. Asana gets pretty hot, super hot. And I just can't help to think at times that one that there is pe that there's people right now in hell, and that this life that we live is so important that every day I have a friend named Jack, a brother Jack in the Lord. You know, every three seconds he he went like this. Someone's someone's dead. Someone's going to heaven or hell every single day. That is the reality. That's fact. That's truth right there. And what are we doing? What am I doing? To make sure that... Now, I can't save everyone. Matter of fact, God's the one who saves. But it should be our goal to be used. It should be my goal every day. And not some church every Sunday where, okay, on Sunday I'm only going to preach to this person. No, no, no. Like... Today's Tuesday, and I just texted Joshua like I want I, I, I want to I want to stir something in Joshua. It's just it's it's so real it's so real, it's so real. And you know, if I if I think that sauna's hot, and you're kind of feel trapped in that room, can you imagine what hell is? I uh, it's like I don't even want to keep talking about it because you just it's it's a lot. It's a lot. Bottom line is we need to reach the lost. We need to reach the lost. Man, this 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 one got to me. I tell you what, man, the rich man and Lazarus. I tell you, it's just right. chapter seventeen, sin, faith, duty, verse one. Jesus said to his disciples, "Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come." It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a mouse millstone excuse me, tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. If they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Verse 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, Prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that you may eat and drink? Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Verse 10. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Jesus heals ten men with leprosy. Verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, and he was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Verse 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, asked were not all ten cleansed? Were all the other where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for 
this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. So only one man came back out of the ten. And goosebumps is just, it's just hitting me, man. It's, as soon as as soon as I crossed over to the New Testament, I'm just getting I'm getting beat. I'm getting beat in a good way. I'm in a good way. In my opinion, a good way to read the Bible is what James says in the book of James, which we will read later on toward the end of the Bible. Which is Jesus' brother, um, half brother. Um, it says to not only be a hearer of the word, See, I'm hearing it. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm also doing these videos and recording myself, not only for accountability, but to hear. I just don't want to. I'm, I'm not saying that's bad, just reading without speaking, but I want to. I want my mind to hear. I want it to hear through my own voice. And I want my own lungs speaking every word from the Word of God. Because I think that's powerful. And James says, not only to be a hearer of the Word, but a doer so that's my opinion is a great way to read the word so when I'm reading this I'm like okay how can I implement this I need to implement this because I can't just be a hearer of it I need to be a doer of it and yes it can be hard but you know what I, I'm, I, I'm not gonna do this life alone I, I, that's why we need brothers in the Lord sisters in the Lord fellowship in the Lord and and to help each other out and and, and, and to do this life together you know The coming of the kingdom of God. Verse 20. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's in my midst right now. In where I live. In where I lay my head to sleep. In where I... I put my feet on the ground. It's everywhere. Like I said, it's church, the American church today is, uh, oh, I'm going to go to church Sunday and I'm good. I'm good. Checking the box, that one hour service. We can't put God in a box. We can't limit God in a box. It would be like limiting his creativity, his imagination. Come on, man. God created this, all of this. The beautiful trees I see outside my window. You know, the beaches, the ocean, the water, the stars at night, the heavens, the earth. Come on. All right. Where was I? Oh yeah, in your midst. Okay. Then he said to his disciples, Jesus is speaking right now, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, There he is! Or, Here he is! Do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day 
will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. Verse 25, but, the fir but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will, will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. It will be just like this one on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who was on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, and the other left. I believe it's talking about the rapture. My, my, my thoughts, my opinion. Me and my uncle were talking about this one day. Oh my gosh, Uncle Uncle Kike, Theo Kike. I'm gonna have to give him a call and give him the good news. I'd be returning back to Colorado Christian University. Verse 35: Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, and the other left. Where, Lord? They asked. He replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. They're dead. They, they went up to with the Lord. Right? Makes sense. Alright, that completes chapter 17. Joshua actually replied back to me. Sweet. Wow. He said, I'll probably be going to your church this Sunday. Look at that. That is cool. Look at that. Maybe there's some rejoicing right now in heaven. I don't know. <laughs> um, I got 17 minutes. Text, text him back. All right. Chapter 18. The parable of the persistent widow. Verse 1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, I'm going to highlight that, always pray and not give up, always pray and not give up, always pray and not give up. Like this Roe v. Wade, overturned in the name of Jesus. Like prayers, pray, pray, pray. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, verse 5, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she will not eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night will he keep putting them off I tell you he will see that they get justice and quickly however when the son of man comes will he find faith on the earth okay the fact that he had to throw in that question at the end is like ah what <laughs> but um that's a good parable a real good parable man God hears your cries. Just make sure, you know, just whatever's on my heart, like things I'm thinking about right now, just continue to pray and don't quit. Continue to pray, don't quit. Give it to God. Give it to God. Just keep on. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Just keep on. Just keep on. 
Don't stop. Just don't stop. Keep praying. The enemy doesn't want you to pray. The, the enemy wants to stop you from praying. Because if he can stop your praying, he can, stop, he can stop your lifeline from the Lord. That's your lifeline. Your prayer. Direct communication to the Father. Direct communication to Jesus. Direct, direct, direct. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You're more than welcome in this atmosphere, Lord. Amen. Amen. The Parable of the Pharisee and the Tax Collector To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Verse 10 Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you, and I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The little children and Jesus. Okay, verse 15. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. So this is, we have insight on, to give your, um, I guess to not baptize your babies, but consecrate your babies to the Lord at a very young age. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little, little children come to me. And do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these truly I tell you anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never eat it the rich and the kingdom of God okay Verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. My goodness, I got to humble myself right here. Verse 20, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy. He said, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In verse 25, Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible for man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Verse 30, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus predicts his death a, second, a third time. Verse 31, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. A blind beggar receives his sight. Verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, 
A blind man was sitting on the ro by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, then told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 40, Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. And that completes chapter 18. Let me get a water break. Chapter 19, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was healthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, or look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Parable of the Ten Minas While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed, king and then to return then he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas but put this money to work he said until i come back but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say we don't want this man to be our king verse 15 he was made king however and returned home then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has entered, has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant. His master replied, Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Verse 20, Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why, the, why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Verse 25, Sir, they replied, He already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be keen over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, 
verse 30, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Verse 38, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Verse 40, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. So this is a, we have an account of Jesus uh, crying, weeping. He wept over it and said, "If you, Eve, if you, even you." had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you whom, or when your enemies will build an embankment against you and, and encircle you and hem you in, in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So we, we see God's, we see Jesus' emotion right here. We see that he cares for his city. And that means that we should care for our city. Jesus at the temple. Verse 45. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer. Letter B, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. Oh, Jesus. But you have made it a den of robbers. Letter C, Jeremiah 7, 11. Again, when I quote the letters, I just go to my footnotes, and the footnotes give some more insight. And I just go to letter C, C, and it says Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Okay. Verse 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Back to page chapter 19. Now I will stop right there. And we'll, we'll go to chapter 20 later today. Um, wow. Um, so we're 14 and 19 here, yeah, five chapters, okay. Man, um, I'm definitely going to spend some time praying after I close this video. Um, and, um, Remember, pray, keep praying, and don't give up. Keep praying, and don't give up. Amen. Bye-bye.